Hello and welcome back to Readings and Impact Investing. My name is Daniel Rosell and this is a YouTube channel uh, that is about me reading important documents from the world of impact investing to make them accessible to people who want to listen to these reports rather than read them. So uh, this is chapter two of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment, GSG. They have a report that is uh, called Accelerating. Time to Accelerate Capital Mobilization for the SDGs in Emerging Markets. And uh, just for those who haven't listened to the previous chapter or the executive summary, uh, this was an input paper to the Impact Task Force or the ITF who uh, put out their 2023 status report this month or this month when I'm recording this video, December 2023. Um, so let's get on then with chapter two, which is talking about the role of DFIs in unlocking private capital. All right. DFIs, MDBs and PDBs urgently need mandate reform alongside change in strategies and operations to be able to scale up private capital mobilization. Private capital often requires more de-risking in EMDEs and guarantees and blended finance are proven tools that work to support such investments. DFIs, MDBs and government shareholders must share essential data, making the GEM's database accessible for better investor understanding of risks and rewards in EMDEs and boosting capital allocation. A lot of acronyms there, as usual, unfortunately. Uh, as they crop up, I will try to uh, just kind of throw them down unless they're very uh, commonly known, like the OECD, for instance. MDBs, multilateral development banks, and DFI's development finance institutions are vital for mobilizing private investment flows to EMDEs, emerging markets and developing economies, where financial markets are still developing. While precise private capital mobilization mandates differ by institution, DFI's invest in sectors and industries critical for sustainable development. For example, energy, infrastructure, banking and health. And they also support regional cooperation, economic integration and intra-regional trade within the region of between states. Defining capital mobilization. Private capital mobilization refers to additional financing from private sector entities that occurs because of, and this is important, because of a bilateral or multilateral development bank, MDB, or development finance institution, DFI. Two definitions are generally used by practitioners, and uh, these are them. MDB harmonized definition, the sum of private direct and indirect mobilization, where direct refers to financing from a private entity on commercial terms due to the active and direct involvement of an MDB, leading to a commitment, and indirect refers to financing from private entities provided in connection with a specific activity for which an MDB is providing financing, where no MDB is playing an active or direct, leading to the commitment of the private entity's finance. And the OECD's definition of capital mobilization, which is a bit simpler, the ways in which specific mechanisms stimulate the allocation of additional finance res financial resources to particular objectives in line with the OECD's thinking, the methodologies for reporting on amounts mobilized are defined by instruments. To mobilize capital, so that those are that's the end of those two definitions. To mobilize capital amidst risks, risks real and perceived risks, many employ a range of de-risking tools and instruments, including subordinated capital offerings, guarantees, risk insurance, securitization, local currency financing, and various partnership models. The ITF's 2021 report detailed many of these instruments and strategies and called for the immediate scaling up of their use. In the two years since, mobilization figures have not improved, and MDBs and DFIs have been placed in the hot seat at the heart of heated debates on how they can deliver higher impact while being additional and mobilizing private capital. At the same time, a series of studies and articles have provided a more sophisticated understanding of how DFIs operate, their respective constraints and the trade-offs they face, while still calling for swift change at the system-wide and DFI levels. One important trade-off that MDB and DFI stakeholders often grapple with is that capital mobilization at a scale usually happens in middle to high-income countries, with deals that are commercially attractive for private investors. Whereas market building objectives in lower income geographies or riskier innovations typically have lower potential of private capital mobilization. Both approaches will require different financial instruments and investment processes, therefore, with an important impact on MDB and DFI strategies and business models. 
As is discussed in the next section, a global MDB DFI reform agenda is underway to address the need for clarity and targets on such issues. Chapter 2, Section 1. Advancing Reforms, Crossing the Line from Talk to Action. MDB DFI mandate reform is essential to drive up adoption. Private capital mobilisation figures have not significantly increased in the last two to five years. The scale of the challenge necessitates urgent reform to mandates with appropriate safeguards, clear targets and incentives. Private sector finance mobilised in 2021, the most recent year of data available, amounted to $40.3 billion according to the OECD, augmenting $186 billion channeled through Overseas Development Assistance or ODA. So just to repeat that, private sector finance mobilized in 2021, the most recent year data was available, was 40.3 billion, according to the OECD, and that was on top of 186 billion that was channeled through overseas development assistance. Yes, that's considerably lower than amounts mobilized in the last five years. Relative capital mobilization figures are disappointingly low, estimated to range between 0.5 to 0.1 0.1 times to 1.5 times and just 0.37 times in low income countries. So those multipliers uh, refers to the amount of private sector finance that is mobilized on top of um, official uh, official development assistance or ODA. Um, so that is the multiplier. And uh, 0.1x to 1.5x in uh, in, uh, in in countries overall, but just just an average of 0.37x in low-income countries. Between 2018 to 2020, most private capital was mobilized through direct investment in companies and special purpose vehicles, guarantees, credit lines, and syndicated loans. There are positive signs that DFIs and MDBs are succeeding in mobilizing capital for the regions and countries that need it the most. Between 2018 and 2020, Africa was the largest region for mobilized private capital, accounting for 30% of the total $16.5 billion annually. That was followed by Asia at 28% or $13.5 billion each year, and Latin America and the Caribbean at $8.5 billion per year and 17% of the total. Between 2018 and 2020, Mozambique and India were the main beneficiaries of private capital, and in 2021, India and Brazil received the highest amounts. To build on that progress, global forums have called for DFI and MDB reform that challenges institutions and their shareholders to do much more. During this time, influential actors from emerging markets and developing economies have assembled a unified stance to address systemic inequality within the financial system. This is exemplified by the Bridgetown Initiative unveiled in Barbados in July 2022 and the ensuing Summit for a New Global Financial Pact, which was held in Paris in June 2023, which sought to encourage more financial solutions to poverty, curb global emissions and elevate the importance of protecting nature. Box 5. Our ambition from less than 1x to 10x of private capital mobilisation. A new data visualization website created by the OECD provides details on the total official support for sustainable development, an acronym called TOSSD, which amounted to $435 billion in 2021, of which $41 billion of private capital was mobilized. A simplistic calculation tells us that if we were to multiply a private capital mobilization by 10, we would be much closer to closing the SDG funding gap, which stands at approximately $4 trillion per annum, with only $3.9 trillion potentially available, as per the OECD's figures below. Although difficult to quantify, it is also fair to predict that with the level of private capital mobilized close to $0.5 trillion, more investment opportunities would be created to unlock institutional investments for the SDGs in EMDEs, priming a much-needed pump. However, a range of experts approached for this report, including those working outside of DFIs and MDBs, cautioned about the lack of realism in such a target for all of the reasons explained in this report. The barriers for such a shift to happen are numerous, from the lack of incentives and targets at all levels, to credit ratings constraining business models, from operating processes to organisation cultures. However, there is consensus to push for courageous revisions of risk models, better understanding of what works, and where to set more ambitious mobilisation targets by business segments, 
the result being much more realistic mobilization ratios of four to five times, and the implementation of new approaches to capital mobilization, such as those described in British in British uh, Investment International's latest paper on this issue. And there's a link there in this paper to the BII website. Following these initiatives, there is a growing movement calling for greater steps to be taken to address and reform the unjust debt burden placed on emerging and frontier market countries, affecting their credit risk ratings and resulting in a higher cost of capital for foreign investors. To address this challenge, MDB and DFI shareholders, as well as EMDE governments, have been called upon to engage with the private rating agencies in order to adjust ratings in line with the available data. According to these and other local stakeholders, EMDE government and private sector actors have been penalised by perceived risk higher than real risk, forcing them to channel funds towards debt repayments rather than local investment needs. 212. The MDB and DFI reform agenda is progressing. In 2023, G20 Delhi asked the Independent Experts Group, the IEG, to identify areas ripe for change. IEG's two reports issued this year lay out key topics, opportunities to expand MDB and DFI lending capacity, whole of bank approaches, diversifying financial instruments, managing greater risk, and building partnerships at scale across MDBs and DFIs and with the private sector. Broadly speaking, the reform agenda has called on MDBs and DFIs to reform their mandate and introduce necessary safeguards, set mobilization targets and incentives that will create the underlying governance and the organization culture to work much closer with the private sector to channel investment to bankable deals and sustainable development. A quote here from an independent expert, a lot of the required changes will be about DFI governance. Today, DFI DFI board members make comments, but then nothing happens. Box 7, Capital Adequacy Frameworks, a topic at the heart of MDB and DFI reform. A key topic cited in the Independent Experts Group's reports is the need to reform capital adequacy frameworks to enable MDBs and DFIs to take more risk. Besides the IEG's findings, independent research has also been conducted into capital adequacy frameworks. Often cited by institutional investors as a hurdle to investing in EMDE debt. A recent publication by the Netherlands Advisory Board on Impact Investing, Changing Perceptions and Analysis of Private Debt in Emerging Markets Under Solvency, found that capital requirements are not excessively high and that, if embraced by insurers, could translate into an additional $52 billion, 50 billion euro, of impact investments to emerging markets from Dutch investors. Alongside reform to capital adequacy frameworks, Mandate and business models account for one of the key constraints limiting most DFIs for mobilising greater sums of private capital. A paper published by the OECD, The Funding Model of Bilateral Development Finance Institutions, unpacks the funding models of three DFIs, FMO, AFD and BII, to show how funding models have material implications on how DFIs mobilise private capital and the instruments they can employ to do so. Greater transparency around these funding models will not only help share help shareholders hasten to adoption of needed reforms, but it can also have the benefit of fostering improved synergies between MD- MDBs and DFIs, as well as external stakeholders who can develop pipeline in alignment with what the specific DFIs are able to support. Image 4 from the OECD is a tale of three cities, pros and cons, and it's uh, three DFIs. Firstly, British International Investment, or B, uh, BII. Secondly, FMO. And thirdly, uh, AFD. The pros cited for BII are they have a high risk tolerance and they are positioned to take on longer investment horizons and they have operational simplicity. The cons are limited growth path. They cannot use debt issuance for mobilization and they have single currency funding. FMO's positives are flexibility to develop a funding strategy, strong explicit support from Dutch government now with a debt ceiling and off balance sheet vehicles for high risk investments. The cons, low economies of scale, hedging greater than large collateral flows greater than cash holdings and they have a max 12 year maturity due to government agreement that is the dutch uh, dfi then we have uh, afd the pros are benefits from economies of scale that has uh, repercussions in debt issuance hedging and risk management and insulation leads to high efficiency afd guarantees to manage headroom the cons are limited responsibility means limited power and flexibility Leverage model means limited capital wriggle room. Box 8. Breaking the MDB and DFI originate to whole model. 
Most DFIs and MDBs still operate under an originate to hold model, originating investments that they hold for the long term. However, most of those institutions can afford to take bigger risks, and by doing so can de-risk assets for private investors, arguably without jeopardizing their balance sheets. This shift to an originate to share model faces a number of systemic barriers that must also be overcome. And these are the barriers. And this uh, is from the Center for Global Development 2023. Mandate. DFIs and MDBs need a stronger mandate from shareholders to mobilize capital and create pipelines. Business model. Operational misalignments exist with regard to fees, portfolio balance, origination and operations. Regulatory accounting and treatment. Some DFIs and MDBs operate under regulatory regimes that may inhibit mobilization activity, limiting their ability to issue bonds or equity. Scale, small investment programs make it hard to cover the fixed costs of syndication desks, funds or other structures to share assets, while small portfolios offer less risk diversification and smaller ticket sizes for investors. Pipeline, DFIs and MDBs must identify, qualify and structure assets with a risk return profile acceptable to commercial investors. Lack of targets and incentives. According to a 2022 OECD study of MDBs and DFIs, only 18% of the financial instruments used had private financial mobilization as a main objective. Finally, perception biases. A G20 report found that government agencies and credit rating agencies have overestimated the financial risks facing DFIs and MDBs. Their core strength, risk mitigation, technical assistance that would diminish or even preclude extreme risks from occurring. In response to better understanding of the hurdles, DFIs are starting to implement reforms to address these barriers and increase mobilization rates. For instance, some institutions such as the EBRD and the United States Development Finance Corporation, DFC, have started to review their strategies to ensure that their portfolios are truly catalytic. Box 9. Honing the way that capital mobilization is accounted for. For some DFIs, leading definitions have proven to be too narrow in light of the varied activities undertaken by DFIs. This has led some to develop more comprehensive strategies to account not only for direct flows into DFIs, but also support for sub-investees, investment supported by DFIs' direct investments. In addition, in some cases, market creation is more applicable than capital mobilization. Some DFIs call for greater capital mobilization for specifically high-impact projects, while others place importance on the scale and depth of impact generated rather than the specific mobilization figures. In an effort to expand current definitions of private capital mobilization, BII's 2023 paper, Understanding Mobilization, suggests 10 specific moments of measurement at the institutional level, transaction level, and the sub investee level. I'm not going to read those uh, 10 levels, but they're in the report for those who want to uh, get those from the BII. And you can, of course, also read the original British Investment Institute uh, report. 2.2 Reducing risks for private capital investors by scaling what works. 221 Increasing the use of blended and concessional finance. Blended finance is a widely used approach for de risking transactions and making them more investable. It is becoming a more widely used approach for mobilizing private capital and philanthropic capital for sustainable projects in emerging markets, but it is still severely underutilized. Convergence, which curates and maintains the largest and most detailed database of historical blended finance transactions, reports that blended finance has mobilized $198 billion since 2014. Depending on the aims of the transaction, blended finance can be provided either at market or concessional rates by institutional investors. Blended finance provided at concessional rates is commonly referred to as catalytic capital and is typically provided by philanthropic foundations or donor countries. Both are needed with urgency. Box 10. $1 billion blended finance SDG loan fund originated and managed by FMO Asset Management. Announced in November of 2023, FMO's SDG Loan Fund will mobilise $1.1 billion of investor capital to advance SDGs in emerging and frontier markets using an innovative blended finance model. Investors in the model include institutional investors, Allianz Global Investors, FMO and Scandia, and a charitable foundation, the MacArthur Foundation. The fund will provide capital for high-impact, SDG-aligned loan loans to local companies and projects across Latin America, Asia, Africa and Eastern Europe. The SDG loan fund's large-scale and multi-sector reach is enabled by a first-loss investment from FMO, coupled with the MacArthur Foundation's $25 million guarantee. 
the investment of $1 billion in private capital for affordable energy, financial inclusion, and sustainable agriculture in emerging and frontier markets. Despite net growth between 2014 and 2021, information from Convergence's State of Blended Finance 2023 report finds that blended finance transaction deal volumes were down 45% in 2022 compared to the previous year, from $14.3 billion to $6 billion, and climate blended finance transactions were at a 10-year low. The data is especially troubling given Blended Finance's private sector mobilisation potential. Blended Finance solutions have been found to leverage $4 of commercial capital for every dollar of concessional capital. Unfortunately, only a fraction of this commercial capital, $1.10, has come from the private sector, with the balance largely provided by MDBs and DFIs. Box 11. From good examples of capital mobilization to a more systematic approach to private capital mobilization. Private Infrastructure Development Group, PIDG, $284 million in 2022 for developing and creating infrastructure assets that private investors can invest in, had a mobilization ratio of 1.9 times. The ILX Fund, an emerging market credit fund that invests in MDB and DFI originated loans, was set up with seed funding from the German, Dutch and UK governments and it has raised $1 billion so far from Dutch pension funds. And there's more examples, I'm not going to go through all of them again, I'm just trying to highlight the key data from this report, but if you want to read the rest of those examples, they can be found on page 25 in the printed report. Those page numbers might not correspond exactly with the PDF. More can be done. For one, better discipline is required to ensure that blended structures are being used by the right actors, under the right terms, and for the right goals. Another area of concern is the need for more philanthropic capital to de-risk and design a new pipeline of investable deals. Critically, the supply of concessional capital to climate-blended finance deals has been stagnating since 2017. And even in 2017, there was only a minor increase from $967 million per year between 2007 to 2019 to $1.08 billion from 2020 to 2022. Or rather, that increase was very minor, relatively speaking, and it's nowhere near the levels required to reach key mobilization targets. To address the gap, Convergence has called for the creation of a critical mass of catalytic funding, spearheaded and optimised by launching a catalytic funding network of public and philanthropic organisations. With just energy transition constituting a primary driver of private capital mobilisation in EMDEs, catalytic funding in the form of social investment will be especially needed to support the communities most vulnerable to job losses in the energy transition and the physical risks of climate change. Importantly, philanthropic capital is not only needed within transactions themselves for de-risking purposes, but it is also needed to design a new pipeline of fit-for-purpose investments instruments that bridge the finance gaps with economically sustainable solutions that can be taken up by local actors, government banks, pension funds, fund managers and more. Convergence's design funding platform, similar to programs GSG has run in 2022 to 2023, with backing from the Catalytic Capital Consortium, C3, has mobilised $12 million to date since 2017 under its Market Acceleration Programme, providing early-stage grant funding focused exclusively on the design of innovative blended finance solutions. Vehicles and mechanisms designed under this programme have gone on to raise upwards of $1.9 billion for the SDGs. 2.2, boosting the use of guarantees to de-risk investment. Blended finance transactions can be boosted and further de-risked through the adoption of guarantees. The three types of guarantees most often used for this purpose include credit guarantees, risk guarantees and currency guarantees. Other types of guarantees relevant in the context of scaling investments are liquidity extension guarantees, payments guarantees and performance guarantees. A 2023 paper from the Blended Finance Task Force calls for a smarter use of public capital in guarantee products. According to its research, guarantees show the highest mobilization ratios among other de-risking instruments, on average mobilizing $1.5 of private capital for every dollar of MDV capital and outperforming the average mobilization ratio of loans and equities by sixfold. However, they represent less than 5% of total commitments in the analyzed data. 
a smarter use of public capital that addresses credit and currency risks, streamlining guarantees to reduce transaction costs and linking projects in national plans can help meet the 5x scale-up in climate finance needed in EMDEs. Box 12 uh, lists provide some examples of sovereign guarantees that help to de-risk investment and ensure competitive returns for private investors. And I'm just going to read the second of these. Uh, there's actually four in total. And again, if you want to dive into those, uh, read the uh, read the report, the original report. The European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus, or EFSD Plus, is a guarantee program designed to increase the guarantee issuance by European financial institutions towards investment in EMDEs. The instrument makes available $41.6 billion in guarantee capacity. EFSD Plus covers a share of the risks. DFI partners can match the EFSD Plus guarantees with their own resources to attract additional investors. A beneficiary of the EFSD Plus program is Gawa's Capital Haruma Fund, a $228.8 million Spanish private equity fund that invests in financial service providers and SMEs in the agricultural value chain in EMDEs. Gawa Capital is a member of GSG's affiliated Spanish NAB. The fund receives contributions from the EFSD Plus and Spanish DFIs for de-risking components. $10.4 billion for the first loss tranche and $2.8 million for subordinated debt to enhance its risk return profile. The EFSD Plus guarantee effectively acts as a revenue enhancing instrument, ensuring pension funds that have co-invested in the fund are able to meet their fiduciary duties. 223. Harnessing the growing engagement of institutional investors. Impact investing, a rapidly growing subset of a wider environmental, social and governance ESG market, valued at $35.5 trillion in 2020, is effectively doubling year on year, up from $164 billion in 2016 to roughly $3 trillion in 2023. With the pace of new ESG disclosure regulation proliferating globally, the impact and sustainable investment market is expected to continue growing, and with it, demand for new investment opportunities, especially in higher growth EMDE markets. To meet this pending demand, more bankable projects must be developed and new pathways generated, allowing capital to flow both to large-scale and capital-intensive solutions in EMDEs such as infrastructure, private debt, and firms on listed markets, as well as to local capital providers working to meet extensive financing gaps facing small and growing businesses. Zoom in on infrastructure, a key area for further development. As referenced in our ITF 2021 report, Mobilising Capital for a Just Transition and the SDGs in Emerging Markets, infrastructure represents immediate investment opportunities for domestic and international institutional investors. The global infrastructure market currently has a $3.6 trillion annual funding need, according to the World Bank. In emerging markets, McKinsey estimates that the total annual infrastructure investment needed over the next 15 years, just to keep up with GDP growth, amounts to more than $2 trillion per annum. With the lack of available performance data, most global investors are hesitant to approach the sector. Yet, as explored by the Financial Times in its African projects, sorry, this is a quote, African projects have a reputation for risk, but in reality, default rates are often lower than elsewhere, unquote. This is because these projects often integrate uh, blending and de-risking components that make them compelling for institutional investors. Sustainable infrastructure to meet the needs of a changing climate. EMDE firms like PIDG, AIIM, 91, along with initiatives like the Global Infrastructure Facility, are providing local solutions while mobilising large pools of capital. Their efforts should be supported, scaled and replicated. PIDG TA, supporting technical assistance to enable more sustainable infrastructure. PIDG TA supports private infrastructure development group, PIDG, companies by providing grants for technical assistance and feasibility gap analysis. Its core business, backed by a number of governments, provides guarantees for infrastructure projects across Africa and Asia that support early stage infrastructure development projects. Through this combination of technical assistance and local currency investment, PIDG has been able to leverage $1.9 billion ODA to $25 billion. African Infrastructure Investment Managers Multi-Layer De-Risking Strategies African Infrastructure Investment Managers, AIIM, develops and manages private equity infrastructure funds and works predominantly in East and West Africa. With offices in South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya and Cote d'Ivoire, the firm has raised $3.7 billion for infrastructure projects. 
According to the firm's direction, projects are de-risked following a multi-tier approach to address both perceived and real risks. The firm puts various levels of risk mitigation in place to make projects investable for international pension funds, bringing projects essentially to a AAA credit status. De-risking initiatives include government guarantees, contracting with global first-tier contractors, and contracts that are in hard currency. With these measures in place, investors are able to gain exposure to results that outweigh the risks. 91 supports domestic private sector actors. 91 is a 123 billion AUM global asset management firm focused on investing in EMDEs. Its Emerging Africa Infrastructure Fund has committed just over $1.3 billion to 55 infrastructure projects across Africa. In contrast with most approaches, the fund only supports private sector developers of infrastructure as opposed to lending to state actors. The firm's support for private sector initiatives has helped to facilitate solar power in Rwanda and transportation infrastructure in East and West Africa. Global Infrastructure Facility, a multi-sector platform worthy of scale. The Global Infrastructure Facility is a G20 initiative established to address the shortage of high-quality, bankable, sustainable infrastructure projects in emerging markets. Housed at the World Bank, GIF brings together governments, MDBs, developers, investors and other stakeholders in mobilising private capital in infrastructure projects in EMDEs. The GIF is an example of an existing platform channeling private capital for sustainable development that should be scaled further. To date, GIF has a global portfolio of over 120 projects under preparation in 58 countries, spread across the transport, energy, social, infrastructure, water and sanitation, and digital development sectors, with a total investment need of $74 billion. Through the GIF support, $50 billion of this capital is expected to be mobilized from private investors. One of the most notable developments to solve for some of these issues was the launch in July 2023 of the Private Sector Investment Lab by IA Banga, who assumed the role in early 2023 as new president of the World Bank. Banga has made clear commitments to boost the bank's lending capacity, especially through private capital mobilisation. The lab is composed of 15 CEOs of large financial institutions such as AXA, BlackRock, 91, Standard, Chartered, Temasek and others who will focus on specific approaches that can provide solutions to unlock large amounts of institutional capital for the SDGs in emerging markets. The lab's first order of business will be developing new financing structures and partnerships for scaling transition finance to renewable energy and energy infrastructure. 224. Additional routes to increase private capital mobilization. And there's a quote here from a C-suite leader in a DFI. This is obviously an anonymous quote. In the last 10 years, we've become a better originator. And in the next 10 years, we will become a better distributor and fundraiser. In the last two years, focus has been placed on encouraging DFIs to take greater risks and do more to create pipeline opportunities of different sizes. Large scale to be able to absorb institutional capital and smaller scale to meet the needs of micro, small and growing businesses. Having explained guarantees and blended finance in depth, this section references additional high potential instruments and tools that can be harnessed by MDBs and DFIs to direct institutional capital to the SDGs in emerging markets. The discussion below draws in particular upon guidance provided in mobilizing capital for the SDGs and a just transition in emerging markets and MDB and DFI innovations for mobilizing private capital, which call on MDBs and DFIs to distinguish between riskier assets that will be held on the balance sheet versus less risky assets which can mobilize more private capital into areas with high impact, such as climate. Suggestions published by the Centre for Global Development provide an especially useful guide for mapping out key opportunities that should be pursued. Balance sheet mobilisation. Equity issuances. These issuances are suitable for cases in which MDBs or DFIs can take on higher investment risk. This enables the MDB or DFI to expand its equity base, which can be leveraged with borrowing, thereby expanding the amounts of capital available for investment. The minority equity can be on equal or different terms to government equity. The private investment also often comes with commercial expertise through appointments to the board of the Development Finance Institution. An example of equity issuance, Box 14, Mobilist, a flagship initiative by the UK government and FCDO, helps products list on global and local public exchanges. To date, the programme has made two commitments with 12 more in the pipeline and or under review. 
Mobilis invested 13.4 billion, uh, sorry, excuse me, million dollars in the Thomas Lloyd Energy Impact Trust, PLC, the first ever emerging markets renewable energy fund, which later went on to raise $115 million in December 2021 at IPO. Through partnerships with stock exchanges in London, Singapore, Johannesburg, Sao Paulo, Manila, Mexico, and Nigeria, Mobilist is helping to channel more capital for sustainable development via listed products on those exchanges. Bond issuances. Issuances are contingent on the size of the bond market in question and on the MDB or DFI's mandate. For instance, a DFI may be mandated by its shareholders to maintain an investment grade rating. However, many MDBs and DFIs could pursue a less conservative risk management policy while maintaining their credit ratings, allowing them to raise capital that can be lent onto private sector subsidiaries for investment or invested on the same balance sheet as sovereign lending. Local currency bonds, the ability to issue bonds is contingent on the size of the MDB or DFI, as well as the level of local capital market development. Nevertheless, they are a growing option as low and middle income countries accumulate savings and their universe of pension funds, insurance companies and sovereign wealth funds matures, creating demand to invest in local currency. Single asset mobilization. Experts call on MDBs and DFIs to operate two distinct lines of business, which will be pursued in different markets and sectors. For example, in areas where there is potential to attract private capital, MDBs and DFIs should focus on their business on originating assets using replicable structures which can mobilize private capital as part of multi-asset portfolios. The article calls on governments to allow their bilateral DFIs to leverage their equity by issuing thematic bonds backed by their investment portfolios, not by government guarantees. Syndicated loans. In the case of syndicated loans, the MDB or DFI acts as both the agent and lender of record for the loan, with private capital co-investors participating in the loan, thereby reducing the institution's financial exposure. Unfunded risk transfers. MDBs and DFIs are able to free up capital and in turn expand their lending by transferring some of the financial risk to another party. Client bond issuance, including local currency bonds and GSSS bonds. MDBs and DFIs can help clients issue bonds, often in local currency, and to local institutional investors, using the market knowledge and where needed their balance sheets to bring issuers and private investors together. And let's look at box 17, which provides an example of the use of these uh, this growing class of security. Client bond, uh, the high potential of GSSS bonds to address SDG financing gaps in EMDEs. A fast-growing market that amounted to $3.8 trillion at the end of 2022, GSSS bonds could help mobilize capital at scale and reduce the cost of capital, especially for just transition projects, while ensuring that funds are directed towards impact. However, issuance in developing markets only makes up 15% of the global GSS bond market. And just by way of quick reminder, GSSS is Green Social and Sustainability Bonds. As we explained in our recent publication, Financing SDGs in Emerging Markets, DFIs have a key role to play in supporting the adoption of GSS bonds in EMDEs. They can issue bonds themselves to demonstrate feasibility, but also provide anchor funding to build investor confidence and catalyze investments from a wider pool of private actors. They can also de-risk investments by issuing guarantees, purchasing first loss or more subordinated tranches, or offering insurance to investors. DFIs are well positioned to offer technical assistance to issuers that possess the right enabling factors and other EMDE stakeholders and facilitate market connectivity by leveraging their convening power. It should be noted that efforts should be made to ensure more EMDE countries can make sovereign issuances by utilizing special drawing rights to issue debt for climate swaps. DFIs are active in launching GSSS bonds as anchor investors as well as bond issuers themselves. For example, IFC invested about $50 million in a sustainability-linked bond, an SLB, issued by Tata Cleantech Capital, the first of its kind to be issued by a private financial institution in India to support the shift to a clean energy economy. AFD's SDG bond issuances. Since 2020, AFD, France's public development bank, has given priority to issuances that reflect the overlap of environmental and social impacts. Was this approach aimed at supporting the just transition? Its newest issuance, a $520 million 15-year sustainability bond, was 12 times oversubscribed. Proceeds will go to one of six defined themes, generating a neutral or positive impact on the SDGs. To date, the development agency has raised a total of $13.9 billion in SDG and climate bond issuances. Multi-asset mobilization. 
To scale up mobilization at the transaction level, MDBs and DFIs, especially smaller ones, should assemble multi-asset portfolios, which can be invested in by institutional investors, including insurance companies, pension funds, and sovereign wealth funds. By bundling assets, DFIs and MDBs can create portfolios large enough and risk diversified enough to attract institutional investors. Portfolio Sales By operating an originate to distributor share, larger MDBs and DFIs can bundle pools of assets worth $500 million or more, tailoring the underlying investments and portfolios to meet investor demand. They can either sell those assets or securitize them, freeing up more risk capital to keep investing in the markets or countries with the most need. Additionally, large asset managers with a number of institutional investors among their clients could use this route as a major R&D opportunity in markets where product offerings are limited, but institutional investor demand is growing. Furthermore, MDBs and DFIs can be encouraged to collaborate with their peers to create investment-grade portfolios that aggregate assets for multiple DFIs. Such a move could have the potential to mobilize trillions rather than billions of private capital over time. Portfolio risk insurance, MDBs and DFIs can take our insurance cover for some of the risk exposures in their investment portfolios. In doing so, the insurer puts its capital at risk, while the MDB or DFI frees up capital for further investment. Privately managed DFI debt funds, DFIs and MDBs have long been investors in funds managed by general partners. In many cases, fund managers in emerging and frontier markets aim to attract DFIs and MDBs as anchor investors in order to draw in other institutional capital. More recently, DFIs and MDBs have taken a more active role in creating new funds, which they design and then put out to tender for private fund managers to manage. Platform companies. Some equity-focused DFIs and MDBs have created holding companies which originate and manage portfolios of investments in a particular industry. Selling equity stakes or offering debt in these platform companies offer investors access to a portfolio that is diversified by country, while the DFIs and MDBs can free up capital to invest in new opportunities. 2.3. Systemic shifts are still required to mitigate key risks and improve risk pricing. Addressing and mitigating currency risk has become a top priority. Tackling foreign exchange risk and scaling de-risking instruments in local currency are both needed to crowd in more institutional investors and to protect borrowers in EMDEs. As referenced by LSE's International Growth Centre, its IGC, in mitigating foreign exchange risk in local currency lending in fragile states, DFIs provide finance mostly through equity and debt. Equity investments are typically left unhedged and subject to local currency risk. Similarly, DFI lending, due to operating constraints, mostly takes place in foreign currency. This can shift currency risks onto borrowers and constrain DFI investment pipelines. Investors in developed countries require hedging solutions to protect against currency fluctuations, which could erode returns, while borrowers in emerging markets, for example, public development banks or SMEs, need assurances to protect them against currency fluctuations that can dramatically increase their debt burdens. As the Blended Finance Task Force references in Better Guarantees, Better Finance, currency risk management mechanisms are becoming a higher priority in the broader development finance system reform agenda as they are key to mobilizing international capital. The Bridgetown Initiative insisted that $100 billion of local currency risk guarantees are needed per year to boost private sector investment into EMDEs and that the IMF and MDBs should take a step forward in providing these guarantees. A variety of proposals are being explored that would enable the scaling of hedging solutions and look to fix the root causes of currency volatility. Among them, the International Growth Centre's 2023 paper, Mitigating Foreign Exchange Risk in Local Currency Lending in Fragile States, suggests forward-looking proposals for the DFI community, including providing technical assistance, TA, to central banks to support the development of money markets and financial stability, and facilitating cross-currency swaps and a local currency credit guarantee that takes on part of the credit risk facing local counterparties and local currency loans. Another solution may be to further scale the currency exchange TCX fund. Established in 2007 by a group of DFIs, TCX allows foreign lenders to provide foreign local currency loans in EMDEs by pooling foreign currency risks in a globally diversified fund with a cushion of first loss capital. TCX took on $1.4 billion of currency hedges in 2022 across 42 countries, with some 65% of those hedges in the least developed and lowest income countries. 
Their fund was active in sub-Saharan Africa, hedging $382 million for the year, while volumes in Asia and Latin America more than doubled versus a prior year. TCX offers opportunities to hedge local currency risk in SDG-aligned projects, ranging from financial inclusion to renewable energy. Increasing transparency and access to data for better decision-making. Supporting the rollout of structural solutions that can de-risk investments for private capital is the need for greater transparency and access to data for investors. Better data will enable investors and credit agencies to discern between real and perceived risk in EMDEs, while improving accountability and decision-making towards achieving the SDGs. Much of that data already exists and is shared among DFIs and MDBs on the GEMS database, which contains historic performance data of their deals. Publishing the GEMS database to third parties through an independent organization with appropriate safeguards is an action a large array of development finance actors have called for and one which we unequivocally support. It is also critical that credit rating agencies and regulators use this data to inform risk assessments and rating evaluations to reflect real rather than perceived risk. The GEMS database has about 10,000 individual records of MDB and DFI credit loss and recovery data across emerging markets from the last 33 years. Its utility is around the strengths of specific types of underlying instruments. This kind of data is absolutely critical for private investors to calibrate their understanding of risk in markets that are less familiar to them. Acknowledging the need for accessible and transparency data while discussions at the G20 around the topic ensue, some DFIs have cooperated with the Publish What You Fund initiative, a global campaign for aid and development transparency, which publishes an annual DFI transparency index, ranking sovereign and non-sovereign DFIs on the availability, quality and consistency of data across 47 indicators, disclosure of financial information at the organisation and project levels. Discussions around unlocking the GEMS database have also furthered ideation around greater performance data sharing and disclosure on the part of pensions and insurance companies on the African continent, or an aggregation of performance data among donors supporting SME finance. Another major development in the direction of further progress on transparency was the launch in June 2020 of the Climate Data Steering Committee, which released recommendations later in 2022 towards the development of a net zero data public utility, NZDPU. The NZDPU would be an open, free and centralised data repository that would allow all stakeholders to easily access key climate transition related data, commitments and progress of businesses and financial institutions towards those commitments. In September of 2023, NZDPU announced a collaboration with CDP, which will provide NZDPU with access to core climate data from hundreds of companies. Measures to mitigate and promote understanding of risk must be supported by capacity building and technical assistance. This could include research, organisation and legal policy change, training and the formulation and dissemination of new learnings. Ultimately, awareness of successful investment examples can drive understanding and dialogue among pension funds and other institutional investors. And finally, we conclude this chapter with a set of recommendations. The conclusion of chapter two of this report from the GSG, Time to Accelerate Capital Mobilisation for the SDGs in Emerging Markets. Recommendation for MDBs and DFIs, scale existing instruments and vehicles that have demonstrated success in mobilising private capital for the SDGs. This is an immediate action which can be implemented now. Guarantees and catalytic capital in blended finance deals and vehicles are well-known instruments and have proven to mobilise around $4 for every public development finance dollar invested. Similarly, successful solutions like MIGA, MCCP, PIDG or TCX could create higher SDG impact with increased funding. MDBs, DFIs and their shareholders to urgently work with MDB and DFI leaders in defining new and ambitious targets and incentive systems around private capital mobilisation, possibly increasing the risk appetite of such institutions towards a better alignment between their business model and development mission whilst focusing on the higher impact they could achieve with such additional capital mobilised. MDBs, DFIs and their shareholders improve information that would enable better risk pricing in EMDES, especially by releasing relevant data. Specifically, MDBs and DFIs need to accelerate the process of making GEMS a new independent entity, enabling investors and third parties to access disaggregated EMDE investment data. This should happen as soon as possible and no later than the end of 2024. 
that is the conclusion of chapter two. Uh, chapter three is going to be domestic EMDE actors and initiatives are leading the way. And thank you for listening. And as I say, uh, if at the end of every episode and the start of it too, if you have uh, colleagues working in the field of impact investing who you think would benefit from listening to these reports in podcast audio format, please consider uh, sharing this link. And of course, uh, if you want to get in touch with me, my email is public at danielrosal.com. Rosal is spelled R-O-S-E-H-I-L-L. Thank you for listening.